detail in each one of these areas. When I say consumer law, this is some of the things I mean. So I would say these are all fair game for the practical exercise and the final exam. You already know what's on the practical exercise, um, but you don't know what's on the final. Ha! Huh? Did you get new glasses? I did. Awesome. I, I know. I do. I notice those things. You're the, uh, you're the fourth person that noticed. Really? The fourth? Man. Crazy. I got these like a month ago. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of federal law relates to your glasses, the purchase of your glasses in the area of consumer law? Like, man, I'm never going to wear my new glasses to class again. I mean, it's got all these consumer protection laws as you look up there. It's been the Consumer Product Safety Act of 1972. Uh, how? Because, because classes have to be maintained in order of safety. Right, so maybe you'll get a product recall on your glasses. Um, you don't see many rectangular frames. I like them. Uh, maybe how they were advertised, right? Maybe there's some limitation on what you can say. Um, I don't know about labeling and packaging. It's pretty much you're clear on what's in them. Yeah, right? you try them on. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I bet the FDA has something to do with it. I don't know how. Did you purchase them with cash or with credit? <laughs> wow, you don't remember? Oh, no, no. Oh, okay. I, I get you. I do it through my uh, Someone my else insurance. paid for them. Yeah, got gotcha. you. <laughs> not cash, not credit. Someone else. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes. <laughs> So um, we'll go into detail into each one of these areas. Now, um, you mentioned state consumer protection law at the bottom, but there's a lot of state law that relates to these different areas that are listed up here. It's not just everything is fed and then there's some state consumer protection laws. So in the area of sales, you'll find both state and federal regulation. Um, so we'll talk about deceptive advertising, uh, things like bait and switch, as an example, labeling and packaging, you know, what they have to tell you about what's in it. We did, we kind of talked about that last week a little bit when we talked about what's in a Big Mac. And I ate at McDonald's this weekend. Nice. That's that was awesome. a little depressing. <laughs> well, you know, we were doing um, what we're, we call ourselves Hudsonville Hillbillies because we kind of don't belong there. <laughs> Our weekend activity was going to the dump and throwing stuff over the edge. <laughs> Tell you, talk about fun. It's all right. I mean, you got to get rid of the stuff anyway. So I'm like, hey, kids, come with me. And they're like, why would we want to go to the dump? You get to launch things off of the. They loved it. So up, anyway. Well, go to school, we love going to the dump with our dad because we bag or stuff up at 7 Eleven. And that's what we did. We stopped at McDonald's on the way back. We did wash your hands. So, um, yeah, it was interesting because I saw the big sign about how much nutritional value there isn't in <coughs> the food. Uh, we'll talk about sales, credit protection, both in terms of reporting, um, collection, uh, what happens if it gets lost or stolen, those type of things. And then we'll talk about consumer health and safety. So there's that term again, puffery. It's got to be at least the third time you've seen that come up right like you know it came up in warranties and it's come up in other areas you know it's really that dividing line between what's deceptive and what's just exaggeration that people would know you know isn't uh, something they should rely on so uh, the FTC the Federal Trade Commission created under the Federal Trade Commission Act has the job of regulating deceptive advertising not puffery so a defense is to say what we were saying is just an obvious exaggeration that no one should rely on. So FTC, you shouldn't bother us. Uh, and there's been lots of cases about that. This was one, this uh, QT case. Does anybody remember those bracelets? Yeah, remember Did you have one? No, but yeah. the ads. They, right. They, 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 they did have and say, oh, yeah, it works great. It works just fine, but right. pain is gone. Yes, so you'd put those <laughs> things on and boop, now you could stand up right. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, they, they ended, the FTC ended up catching them and making them give uh, consumers refunds, uh, saying that this was beyond exaggeration, that this went to people were relying on that to help fix their problems. And there's been other things since. You know, there's 
things that you drink that are supposed to cure all kinds of stuff. I know families that get into selling that stuff. Doesn't the FDA get involved with some of those things too? Yes, because once you cross that line into a drug or some kind of thing that you eat, there's real concern about um, you know violation of those federal laws too. Uh, bait and switch. You probably have heard of that. I don't know why my voice is changing. <clears throat> Yeah, it's been a long, drawn-out process. <laughs> like, it started when I was six, and, you know, now I'm older than six, and it's still going on. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> I started young. I don't know. I <laughs> had zits when I was seven. You know? Anyway, moving on. Uh, you know, it says advertising a product at an attractively low price to lure customers in to buy more expensive items. I read that to you because a lot of people think bait and switch is when they advertise one price and you go in and you spend more money. No, no that's the plan. That's not deceptive. Everybody knows when they see, uh, what do they call it, Black Friday coming up, mm -hmm. right? Um, day after Thanksgiving, big sales, laptop for a dollar. How many of you think you're going to get that laptop? You know, this happened to me once. I got up early. You know, we always go over to the relatives for Thanksgiving, and then the day after we all go early and shop, and we leave the kids back at the house to fend for themselves. So we, um, I got up even earlier than everybody else, made my little thermos of coffee, got my lawn chair and my blankie. I went down to Best Buy way before they're open. I'm going to get that dollar laptop. It's like 3 a.m., I get down there and there's a line already and I start following the line. It goes all the way around the stinking store. These people have been here since yesterday. Well, it's because you left at 3 a.m. You got to leave at like 10 o'clock. I know. I mean, I guess it's, you know, the next day and then the line starts. So, yeah, I mean, it's going to it's gonna end up being relatively cheap anyway. So one, I mean, now I guess they use kind of a voucher system so they pass things out or whatever. But yeah. Crazy, crazy. Yeah, I mean, I went into Meyer one time, and Meyer's kind of weird because they're open all the time. So I go in there, and I was going to get an Xbox 360 for my kid. Yeah. And um, so I'm standing, I'm like, I'm way early. I'm in the front of the line. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. My father-in-law's with me, and he's uh, he'd hold my place in line, whatever. And as soon as they say, go, everybody, the line collapses. Oh, yeah. And everybody rushes the counter, like, and then there's Xboxes flowing, like, crowd surfing onto the, everybody who's waiting for one. So, you know, it's just crazy to think that you're all going to get the same deal. Well, how do they try to address that? They don't promise everybody who comes in a dollar laptop. What do they usually say in the end? Limited quantities, one per store, while supplies last, not giving you a rain check, whatever. They want, it's just... A loss leader to get you into the store, and then when you're there, you're like, oh, well, since I'm here, I'll pay full price, or maybe not. Uh, you know, so you'll look for other uh, deals. But if they're purposely luring you in, you know, this car is this base price with no intent to have that car at all, ever, you know, just to switch you into spending more money. Uh, so this can be a fine line, right, because that's what they do. I mean, they'll, get, they'll advertise a real stripped-down base version of the vehicle, and they often won't even have that one sitting on the lot. Right? Well, they deal with it now, because I've seen, I seen the ads now say, just say that the vehicle shown on commercial mm -hmm. is worth this amount of money. Right. And that way, they get away with showing a car with all the options, and, and not have to worry about it being a stock in the lot. Right. <laughs> all right, online deceptive advertising. Same thing, same rules apply, just the online format. Um, there is... A potential, I think, for perhaps even more deception in that, you know, somebody reads something on a page, sounds good to them, they don't know all the details, they click and they buy it. And then after they buy it, then it adds all kinds of stuff, right? So, um, you know, basically the law says you have to let consumers know what they're agreeing to, or they're not agreeing to it. So if you uh, do have some kind of disclosure, which you're required to do, you ought to have a hyperlink that people can go to and look at the terms. Uh, one of the big ones has been uh, shipping. You know, I'll, I see a lot of major shippers saying there aren't any shipping costs if you do certain things now. But 
still, there used to be, you know, like you'd click on it at a certain price and go, this is a good deal, but then it would add all these other charges on top of it. So now they've made it so that you should see those shipping costs and other costs before you uh, submit. Anybody ever purchased anything through Amazon's one click? So, I mean, basically, there it is. Uh, it's got your terms and everything in it. When you click that button, it's going to ship to at whatever price it is for that. Um, so it's something to, to look out for uh, and to investigate any terms before you uh, click the button. All right. So what can the FTC do if it observes deceptive advertising, you know, for example, those bracelets that we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, certainly they're responsible for uh, policing things, but if it ends up being uh, they have to take some action against you, then it might, or, or a company, an issue, a cease and desist order, quit doing that advertising. Whatever it is that you're doing is deceptive. Uh, or even impose counter advertising. From your reading, what was counter advertising? You know, when the internet, right. Yeah. This is this is the true stuff. What we told you before wasn't entirely honest. And you you see that now. You see on TV. You know. You start to see a commercial. And there's some woman and she's talking about some product, and you're like, okay, well. Then you start listening to it, and it's a big apology. Like earlier, we told you this wouldn't cause cancer or anything else. Well, now we're wrong about that. Or the one that I recall was um, Philip Morris put out um, when they that whole light cigarette thing we we're talking about last week. You know, they put out an ad and put it on the web that said no, no cigarette is a good cigarette. Earlier, we told you that you should buy light cigarettes, and those are still bad for you. So that was counter advertising. It was posed on the, and you know, often it's imposed. It might be self-imposed because they got a big lawsuit, you know, that they have to deal with. Other times, it's the FTC saying you can't run around telling people that. You've got to go out there and correct the, the perception the public has. All right, um, and you know, it's not just online that you get this stuff. Uh, you get telemarketers calling you. You get stuff through faxes. You know, I don't even know what faxes are for anymore. You know, I, this is weird for me because I'm not a paper person in the first place. So. You can bet somebody asked me for a fax number. I don't have one. Um, but all I ever see coming out in faxes is uh, vacations and junk faxes. So anyway, and then, you know, the same thing on the phone. I don't even like to answer the phone. I don't like to talk to anybody because, you know, my, my caller ID tells me it's somebody I want to talk to. I'll pick up the phone. Outside of that, it's some, you know, out-of-state number or some weird thing. I'm not going to answer it. Um, the first bullet talks about the uh, TCPA prohibiting automated solicitation. Well, if that's true, have any of you ever gotten these things? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you still get them. Now, sometimes it's an exception under the Act. So, you know, political campaigns are pretty popular to get those kind of calls. Um, you'll get things that you signed up for. Well, you know, we'll, we'll be somewhere and my wife will say, oh, I'll just sign up for this free drawing or something like you're giving them our information we're going to get a phone call or that's all they want they're selling this stuff or they're using it to market to you yeah she knows that but she's a little more on the you know maybe we'll get something edge of things i know i know it's like who are they you know and i probably got had a big fat check coming and if i'd listen to her we'd be rich now but uh, anyway, so that, there's that. Um, you know, another one is if you already have an ongoing relationship with somebody, they will um, contact you ab about other offers that might be available. So there's a number of exceptions. Um, you know, sometimes it's just it's it is breaking the law, but they're just you know thinking no one will catch them. Um, I got stalked by the Grand Rapids Press. I say stock, you know, not under the statutory uh, definition, but when I moved to Grand Rapids, they, they just, this number, this automated thing just kept calling me and telling me um, if I wanted to sign up. So finally, I called them at the number that they left, and I get a machine, you know, and, you know, I, I dial through and get a person, I'm like, I want your machine to quit calling me, 
uh, my numbers on the do not call registry, I don't want your solicitations. And I hung up the phone and my wife said, you realize we've moved. So if you do move, put your new number on the do not call registry. She said, she's so much smarter than I am. So um, anyway, uh, and then the next one says, consumers have a private civil cause of action and can recover $500 for each violation and perhaps treble, which means triple, yeah, triple. If, um, <laughs> if it's shown to be a willful violation. I, uh, another one that was um, calling me all the time was um, the uh, alarm system, EDT, no, is it EDT? Yeah. ADT. 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 Yeah. ADT is electronic. Anyway, so ADT is calling, and they had this campaign going where, and I was away on a trip, my wife was pregnant, and this uh, person calls and says, there's been break-ins in your area. How would you like to use ADT? <laughs> of course, she's calling me. She's like, this guy just called and he said some grill's been stolen down the road. I'm like, what? Grill stolen? We better do something, you know. But uh, anyway, so I got home and they, they called again. And I had this, uh, this law beside the phone. And I said, um, I want you to stop calling me uh, if you don't. And I read them the damages that I could get and treble damages, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I hung up the phone, and they didn't call back. But the next day, they showed up at my door. <laughs> yeah, it was weird. They're not, and then I come to the door. I'm like, I thought I told you people to leave me alone. They're like, uh, you called. Did you, you didn't say anything about us visiting. <laughs> and and the guy goes, he's standing in my yard, and he's got the sign stuck in my yard. And he says, how'd you like to have one of these in your yard? And I said, how'd you like to have that sign? Uh, I did. I thought about it. I didn't say it, but I, I did think it. Um, I don't, you know, I don't get that whole thing. Why don't you just steal your neighbor's sign and stick it in your yard? But anyway. Uh, <laughs> right, let's make one. Uh, that'd probably be intellectual property infringement of some kind, wouldn't it? Uh, so, yes, it probably would be, you know, a logo that they're entitled to use. I'm sure someone else has thought of that. Anyway, so I told them, you know, please don't come back on my property. Don't call me. Um, and then they, they, uh, they didn't after that, but... Um, they're persistent. Uh, there, there is a law separate from the do not call registry that says if you do notify telemarketers that you want them to take your uh, number off the list, then, um, you know, they're smart. They've got all kinds of workarounds to this stuff. Um, but also they prey on people just not knowing this. Um, just, just got my name. You know, if they're persistent, it's like, hey, I know a lawyer. No. Don't. Don't. It, don't. it just makes them more persistent. <laughs> like, oh, yeah? Right. Uh, labeling and packaging. So, um, you know, there's requirements under all kinds of different acts, almost all of these before you were even born, um, from wool to fur to kids' pajamas, uh, chewing tobacco, you know, you're probably the most common one you're familiar with is uh, the last one, Nutrition Labeling and Education Act, like putting what is in products, what's required to be on there. I, I uh, went to Arby's. Man, I did a lot of fast food. But to make up for McDonald's, I got this new chopped salad, which, by the way, is just lettuce chopped up, and then they take the chicken tenders that you gave your kids and throw it on top of the salad. <laughs> I'm like, awesome. <laughs> so I, I pull, they, they, they give it, I didn't even ask me what I wanted on it. They just shipped it out with buttermilk ranch. And I flipped the thing over. Guess how many grams of fat this, uh, 22 grams Jeez. of fat. So I like just, I mean, I just opened it and I like, I just kind of whiff some air <laughs> to my salad. Yeah, it's it's not a lot. And like the serving size, yeah, it's not even the whole package. So I don't even know how much fat is in the whole package. But, you know, yeah, that's a good one to look out for. You you get all proud. And you're like looking at, oh, there's not only this, but then multiply that about, you know, how much servings you're actually ingesting. But, I mean, 22 grams of fat for, you might as well just stick it right on your hips. <laughs> right. Um, sales. Uh, we've talked about uh, internet, phone, 
Um, you know, it could be door to door sales also. Uh, mail ordering through the mail. I, mean, I don't know how many people order things through the mail. You guys order anything through the mail? Yeah. You know, you electronically you do it, but then it ships. Um, uh, really? Why do you want that paper? I don't get it. Can't you get the same thing online? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Never mind. Uh, um, <laughs> what magazine is it? It's a bow hunter magazine. A bow hunter magazine? Yeah. You don't think you can get bow hunting online? You can get cows, but you can't get their whole magazine. It's not, they don't have it available. Anymore. Yeah, well, you don't need all that commercial stuff anyway. You just want the the good stuff, you can't get right? I mean, you could take like could take an iPad right in the toilet now. So, what do you need? <laughs> okay, maybe that's not a good idea. Especially if you drop it. Yeah. <laughs> um, telephone and mail order. So, you know, ordering things over the phone. I guess that still happens. And then um, the unsolicited receipt of merchandise. Basically, uh, we'll talk about the Postal Reorganization Act. And I know that's exciting. Um, most states. So now we're talking about state law here. Most states um, have a cooling off period. So if somebody does come to your door, I mean, that's different than you going out and finding something on the Internet. That's somebody coming to your door and trying to sell you something. I mean, I always think of those rainbow vacuums or something like that, you know. Um, and I also notice other people who come to your door have different sales techniques, like um, the Schwann man. You know, is it Schwann? In the yellow yeah. Truck. Yeah, I mean, he pulls up. He's real cool, man. I, like, I don't like people coming to my door. It's, it's weird. Are you getting? I don't like to talk to anybody, and I don't want anybody to come on my property. I'm a hillbilly. So, um, you know, they're coming. I'm like, uh, nothing today. They're like, oh, cool, no problem. Good to see you, Gary. You know, and they leave. But, you know, you get um, some of these pushy people who come to your door trying to sell you meat, encyclopedias, vacuums. They don't want to leave until... They sold something. I'm, some people who work for those places tell me, like, they try to get in your house. Once they get in your house, they don't want to leave. You know, they'll, they'll slit their wrist, drop blood on your carpet, suck it up. What, you know, they'll do anything to try to get you uh, to buy it. Yeah, another strategy is just stay there so long you feel obligated to, to do something. You know, they got some sad story about, you know, their family being held hostage or something. Well, another example uh, that is, People come around saying, well, if I sell this many stuff, I'll get a trip mm, to somewhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so please get over to this because I can need this trip. And it really goes on your right. like, if you don't If you don't do this, you're going to make this person feel bad. It's like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get the Girl Scouts, you know. Mm -hmm. I just slam the door on them. <laughs> so um, in that case, if you make a rash decision, you end up buying something door to door. Most states have a statutory post-sale cooling off period you know it was you maybe you made it in like I almost did that with the new MacBooks you know because mine's broke I, I like they came out with new MacBooks this week and I'm like I ran right to check out the the new Mac store and they're like oh we don't have any yet because I mean I usually don't do that I usually like stay away so that I don't but I it's impulsive I'm like man those are cool Um, all righty. Okay. Talking about telephone and mail order. Um, sometimes if you order something through the mail, you won't get it. You know, it'll say it's back ordered or whatever. Um, my wife is ordering stuff almost every day. Um, she gets a lot of curriculum books and things like that. And inevitably, when she opens it up, something's missing. Uh, you know, and... Under the law, they're required to let you know what's missing and that it's on back order and that they will promptly ship to you. Promptly, I guess, is loose, you know, whatever that means. When we get it, we'll get it to you uh, type thing. But, you know, supposedly if they don't get it to you in the promised time, you know, they're supposed to do something to get your money back. Um, and then under the Postal Reorganization Act, which sounds a whole lot like reorganizing the post office, but in, in terms of us talking about consumer protection, if you get unsolicited notice that it's underlined, it's not like you ask for something and then you don't want to pay for it or you get your neighbor stuff by mistake. This is if they ship you something that you didn't ask for, you didn't agree to pay for, you get to keep it. 
Like one time my wife got um, a bunch of children's books shipped to her, which it turns out that's fairly common. And it said, uh, we understand that you didn't ask for this, so you can ship it back and there'll be no obligation, uh, but if you keep it, we'll bill you. She said, well, I didn't ask for it. I don't want it. I don't want to pay to have it shipped back. And I said, keep it. Because if you get, if that's what this law is supposed to prevent. Not you stealing the stuff out of your neighbor's mailbox, but um, from people forcing you to agree to pay for something you never asked for. Now, was, usually, there, was there an issue that they would like send stuff to people and tell them to pay for it? Before yes. Pay for it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like if you think of the whole idea we're talking about contracts where somebody makes an offer and then you knowing the terms accept, they were like shipping you saying you'd accepted it. And then, you know, you know, just like in my wife's situation, then they send her a follow-up bill, right? And said, throw it away. You know, and then if they contact you, it's like, never asked for it, not paying for it, didn't agree to take it. Ship it back. No. The law says you don't have to. I mean, and, and it, basically, you could build in fraud where you just ship stuff to some people, and then you make money off the shipping or you make money off of them feeling obligated to, to pay for it. Now, that's different than you getting something you didn't ask for and then agreeing to pay for it. Like, I always get the, how about the Columbia Records? Or, I don't, they don't have records anymore, but CD or, do they have CDs anymore? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, and then people are like, well, I, I started getting it and then I said I didn't want it. And then they said I had to pay for it. Well, I said that, usually that's because you agreed to pay for it. All right, health and safety. Um, I won't go in detail to every one of these acts, but it kind of gives you a broad overview of the different areas. So as we were mentioned earlier, the FDA is responsible uh, for regulating in this area. There are a number of acts out there. Uh, you probably have a lot of familiarity with uh, product recalls on things. Um, I just got a um, recall on our van. I mean, I'm getting these things constantly. Like the longer we get the van, the more we get them. The latest one is your back back axle might be cracked. Oh, jeez. So nice. please bring it in. This is a <laughs> Ford Windstar. Oh, uh, please bring it back. We'll look at it. If we determine that we need to replace it, we'll let you know when we will do that. I'm like, I, I mean, I'm not driving. My wife's driving. My kids are in it, so, you know. Not a huge deal to me, but um, <laughs> no, I mean, like you get something, you're like, my family's, and I'm gonna, you know, I gotta take it in for that. Uh, and then they're like, oh, what do they do? They're, they're either gonna say, oh man, you got a problem. They're gonna say everything's fine. Then I'm gonna drive around going, okay, is my back axle cracked? So, anyway, um, yeah, they happen fairly frequently. What are some that you've heard of recalls? The eggs. Toyota, you know, like our stuff accelerates or things get stuck or uh, Ford's had some things kind of combust, you know. Seems like baby toys get recalled. Yes, right. Yeah, like because, again, kids. And, uh, the Cubs have McDonald's. Yeah, yeah the Cubs have McDonald's. What's that? Oh, Shrek Cubs have McDonald's. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, really? Uh -huh. oh, come on. <laughs> Seriously, do you not know lead paint for kids is bad for you? Especially something they're going to stick in their mouth? <laughs> Shrek. All right. Credit protection. Well, have you ever seen that wall up like in Myers where they have all the recalls? It's really no. Customer service. Yeah. 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 The wall of shame, there, huh? It's just like every item that has a recall and why they're recalling it. But Yeah. I guess that's a good idea. I never, I never noticed that. I don't walk in and like, hey, let's go visit the recall area. I'm, do they? Send, I wonder, has anybody got a product recall? I mean, I, I imagine they come from the manufacturer, not from yeah. Yeah. Meyer. But yeah. since they sell them, they post them. Do you, po do you post them? Yeah, we'll post them. But we post them right where the the product, where the product is. Product is. So like, we had SlimFast, and they said the manufacturer is having some issues when they're older than that. Oh, okay. I bet I bet um, SlimFast isn't real excited about that. <laughs> like the wall over there, nobody looks at is much better than uh, as you're walking down the aisle. Oh, I guess I better not buy that product anymore. <laughs> so, what's the problem with SlimFast? They had some issue. I don't know. Like people were losing weight too fast or something. 
Shaman. No, it, it, it had a do with... Metal shavings. That's it, bad. It, it, it I'm not saying Slim Fast has metal shavings in it. It had some, like, I don't know, some weird side effect, I think, that was... Mm. That was yeah, I, know, I don't understand that whole thing. I mean, everything on TV says it has a weird side effect, but... Yeah, I, I didn't really understand that either, but that's obvious. We should look it up. Look it up and let me know. <laughs> awesome. All right, uh, consumer protection, uh, consumer credit. Uh, we're going to talk about TILA, fair credit reporting, fair debt collection, and a eh, little bit about wage garnishment. But uh, TILA is primarily a disclosure law. It says let the consumer know what it's going to cost to have credit. If you've ever purchased a car or a major item, you will often see a box on the front of the contract that has required terms on it, like annual percentage rate. Before this, you could say interest is only 5% and then leave out it was per day or something. So now we have a requirement to uh, list uh, not only the annual percentage rate, but what it's going to cost you to borrow the money, which really, if you're... Um, shopping for a car or something is a good idea because a lot of the cost isn't in options or much variation in, in dealer price. It's more in uh, how much they're charging you to borrow the money. Yeah. Another thing that goes along with that is the credit. If you ever get solicitation for a credit card, on the back there's a big old chart table that has mm -hmm. all the fees and so forth. And it's I in that box once, too. Yep. And I looked at all the fees and so forth. And he said, well, you get a $5,000 credit limit, but at the end of all the fees, it became up to only a $1,000 credit limit. You know, After you're done fees, with the fees. Yeah, you have to done with fees. And right. If you use their credit. Point. I'm giving out, you give out $4,000, you can have a $1,000 credit limit. I'm like, no, right. thank you. And now it's the rates of the APR, you know, what your APR is going to be. And mm -hmm. It's a whole back page. It's a big old table, and you always got to look at that because they can get you. Right. Um, and they'll get you over time, too. You know, mm -hmm. That stuff applies month after month, year after year. Um, so uh, one of the things you really want to look at is, I mean, over time, how much is that, you know, not necessarily in the case of credit cards, but when you're buying a vehicle, if you have so much interest per year so, or so many months, look at the, how much it's actually going to cost you at the end if you make all those payments. It'll depress you. Yeah, you, you, I think you get a car for five thousand, but then right. at the time you're paying seven thousand five hundred. Right. <laughs> uh, and another big thing is, I don't know if you know this. Probably most people know this. That if you finance through wherever you're purchasing the car for, or through some credit company, they charge you points on top of what they get the credit for. Mm -hmm. So, like, I I went shopping for a van and. Um, I'm, I'm, I cut a deal with a salesperson. I said, I can get it at this interest rate uh, under these terms through my own financing. If you can match that, you can have my business. And the guy came out high-fiving me, which I'm not sure what that <laughs> meant, like maybe to get me excited about it or something. I'm like, I need more than a high-five. So um, he puts, you know, puts everything in writing, and then he calls me into the finance manager's office and as we go to sign the documents, they are not the same, right? And um, I said, well, your salesperson told me this interest rate, this this many months. And he said, well, yeah, but he doesn't know what he's doing. You know, I had to run your credit, and I had to look at what credit we had available for you. And this is the interest rate on this many payments. This is how much it's going to cost you. And then built in credit life and all these other things. And I said... Not going to do it. I said, I will do it for what your salesperson agreed to do it for, or I won't do it. And the guy started talking about his family, turned his picture around, showed it to me, and, and said, believe it or not, said, we'll lose money on this, but we'll do it anyway. And after I quit crying, I mean, if they were losing money, they would not do it, right? But... They were tacking on interest on top of the interest they were getting the money on. And that's why it was costing so much. So you've got to watch out for that stuff. Um, equal credit opportunity. Notice that it says opportunity. Yep. It doesn't say we're all going to get the same credit. Um, most of, by, based on my surveys and all my classes, most of you are not married. Some of you are or are going to be. 
Um, but I am. Do you think I get different credit than you because of that? Yeah. I do. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, right? But, you know, the, the idea is that you may have dual incomes, or if one person can work, the other person can. Um, more income potential, maybe. Uh, and that's a generalization. I mean, it could be the opposite. You can marry somebody. You know that, what is that, creditscore.com commercial where the guy's mm -hmm. always got the rather attractive wife and his credit is bad? Living in the right, yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so all those things, I, I guess, could happen. Uh, but the law says when you extend the opportunity for credit, you can't discriminate based on these categories up here. Race, sex, color, national origin, age, or marital status. But you can score people, and if they end up in your risk analysis being more risky, then you may or may not extend credit to them. So you can't say we'll only uh, give the opportunity for credit to males or only if you're married or if you're of this particular race. Um, but in the end, that may happen that because of one of these categories. I mean, I by survey, I usually determine that almost every of my class is younger than I am. Do you think I get different credit because I'm older than you? Yeah. I do. So, again, sometimes that can be good, sometimes that can be bad. Maybe I had a chance to make more mistakes than you. But it's kind of a circle. Like when you first go to get credit, they want you to have credit to get credit. Right? Show us you have a good credit. Uh, no, I'm trying to get credit. Well, then if you want credit, show us. So that can be a little bit of a circle. Um, but once, notice what's not up there. Like I've been known, a little extra bonus for being here today, I've been known on the final to say um, somebody discriminates based on uh, education or employment. Is that a violation of this act? No. no, those are the two biggest factors that they do consider when they extend credit to you. Do you have a job? And what is your <laughs> potential for getting a job through your education? So if you don't have either one of those things, it's you're probably not going to get a lot of good credit. He's even a car dealership right now. Right. Some yeah, advertise the opposite. You know, the ad say if you have a job, you make this stuff. Right. Month, we, we We're going to give it to you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then these credit card rules. And I would say even this is actually extended to debit cards, too. Um, but, uh, and you probably had experience with this. I, I had this happen. I went, um, my wife and I go on a date once a year, and uh, <laughs> we went to um, see a movie. And I, for some reason, I purchased something. Um, I know it was a year ago since their last date because I purchased it at the Eddie Bauer in the um, mall, the Rivertown Crossing Mall. And they've been, I guess they reopened up, but they've been closed for like a year or something. So anyway, back then I bought something and I shoved my wallet into my, um, I had some like pullover jacket on. I shoved it in there. I went and sat in the movie theater and it went, Poop! fell out and I realized that before I left the movie before I even left my row somebody snatched the thing up like everybody was leaving and it was gone and we turned on the lights and everybody showed up in the theater with their uh, flashlights under it was gone somebody took it so I left the movie theater and called the bank you know they canceled everything and said you know no problem no liability for anything. Of course, there was no one had charged anything yet. But somebody was well on their way to fill up on gas and buy some sneakers. I, I, I say that because there's like an algorithm that flags your credit card. You know, if you do certain things, it thinks it's stolen. Like you ever buy something at an airport, fly on the other side of the country, and then it doesn't work anymore? Right. Well, they'll say, um, but they've done some, they've collected some data that says when somebody steals your card, they fill up their gas tank, they hand it to somebody else, their friend, who then fills up their gas tank, and they all go buy sneakers. I, <laughs> I think that's a generalization. You know, I mean, I think really it's like, um, you know, fill up your gas tank because that, that's a quick way of getting value and then, you know, 
has to do with the age of the people that are I, It to does, them. and I yeah. think, you know, like, it's like an impulse type thing, you know, just buy some, you know, it's, way, it's you know, not rent a car, you know, it's buy sneakers. So you also have a way of, of discouraging that is that at the gas pump, you only allow like $50 with the transaction at the pump itself. Mm -hmm. And you try to go for 50 you have to call them and say, I want more money. So, right. they, you know, this, so that's one way to discourage them while they pump thing on the credit card. Right. Um, yeah, and I think they had some problems with that too when uh, gas went up so high. It's like you couldn't even fill up your tank. I was on my way back from Flint. I was over at Flint last week, and and I think they upped it like seventy five dollars or something just because <laughs> I can't even fill up my van for fifty. Maybe I can. Can I? Yeah, it's close. I think it's, it's, I think it's a little bigger. Twenty four gallons. Yeah, I think so. Well, I think so I guess you figure out the price. It'd be like seventy bucks. Yeah. But the other thing those motorhomes you still see driving around here. They they have to right. do it constantly. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they have some special dispensation to pump more gas or something. Yeah. Uh oh I oh I know why I was telling you that, because there's a sign on the gas pump now that says mm -hmm. if you want to put more in, just shut it off and then run your card again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't understand oh. that quite. I mean, Okay. <laughs> Isn't that kind of the same thing? Yeah, it's not on like the diesel pumps though. Oh. So like. So if you have a big pusher or whatever, yeah. I don't know what they call them, but you can fill it up on more. Um, all right, and then the same thing consu uh, for consumer leasing. There's um, requirements in terms of what you have to uh, disclose. Uh, fair credit reporting. This is reporting. This is not about getting a credit card uh, or collecting debts on them. It's about uh, credit reporting agencies and um, what they can use your information for and what you can do if the information isn't accurate. Um, anybody ever got a credit report? You know, I get, now it's a big cost of email saying yeah. you, something's been changed, your credit report changed. Right. No. Right. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. So was it accurate? No. 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 I had my father's mortgage on that. Awesome. We have, there's only one letter in our name that's different. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I got one and it had me live in places I never lived and jobs I hadn't yeah. ever been to. I'm like, exactly. yeah, so name. there must be someone else with my name. No, they tried to use your name. Oh, it could be that. <laughs> because of the residence and all that, like they're yeah. trying to establish. My husband's cousin has credit in Florida. Oh, family. That's yeah. so what happens when you're hillbillies. <laughs> I know I am one. All right, so um, you should be able to get access to your information. Uh, now there's law relating to getting free credit reports, not to be confused with sites or commercials that advertise getting your credit report, because those aren't free, even though they say they're free. <laughs> right. yep. Which is why you get those emails, probably. <laughs> What's that? Well, yeah, you can get you can get them from the three major credit reporting. So you can right, and then charge you for it. <laughs> yeah. So there is an actual site, if you do careful research, where you can actually get a free credit report from the three and if you split it up you can get it like one third one third you may even get it like three times a year um, are you sure that's it yes I was on it earlier okay <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I don't know the name but what I do is I go to the FTC's I go to the site and then it takes me to the right one because if you try Google or anything else then it's gonna what do you think is going to happen? The ones that are making money are going to get their search results higher. All right. So, uh, but the other part of that is, if there's something that's incorrect, um, usually you're not going to have much luck recovering from the credit reporting agency for damages for that. So you're trying to get a house or a car or whatever, and they report inaccurate information. Usually your sole remedy is to go back and get somebody to clear it up. Uh, kind of a little exchange. They didn't want to be regulated, but they agreed to be regulated in exchange to make it really hard for you to sue them. Uh, if you can establish that they exercise gross negligence, which has been translated to mean they 
after repeated requests don't do what they should have done. Um, but usually they push that back on whoever's reporting the inaccurate information. You got to go through them to to get it cleared up. It usually takes about six months to a year just to get it cleared up. Just get it cleared up. So sometimes it's not yeah. worth it. <laughs> well, you know, I know that some people think about the credit decisions that they're going to be making and then work on getting their credit squared away and their report squared away because that's that does happen. Um, yeah, and here's the you know you also can get these um, fraud alert things. So um, you know if there's somebody attempting to do what we were talking about doing, trying to use your identity, take your uh, identity, that there's some things you can do to get flags to let you know that that's happening. Um, anybody ever had any experience? I haven't done that. Where where it will let you know that somebody made an inquiry about your credit and oh, yeah. Yeah. they call you. They call you? Yeah, I call okay. them once. Okay. What, big what? purchase was just making sure. Oh, okay. So, but that was the credit card company, maybe? Yeah, I think so. Okay. My dad signed me up for LifeLock. That's the one, when that's the one with social security number that died on TV and said, here's my social security number. How long did that take to get hacked? Uh, it actually took like three months. Yeah. So, it wasn't easy, but it did happen. Uh, yeah. yeah, whoops! For about uh, $20 million. Yeah. <laughs> So he's like, oh, yeah, you can't. Here's my social security number. You can't do, and, well. Yeah, it was life Dumb. <laughs> All right, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. So now we're moving not from the extension of credit or the reporting of credit, but to uh, if somebody is trying to collect the debt, what do they have to do? And without going into detail, and um, most of these, are, actually, there's more listed, I think, in your chapter, but um, here are some of the things that... Um, the act of limits in terms of when, where they can contact you, who they can contact, uh, what techniques they can use, um, and what notice they have to give uh, a debtor. Um, basically, um, this last bullet here talks about a validation notice. If you attempt to collect a debt from somebody, you are a debt collector. Now, I know that sounds real simple. But it's important to know. Don't walk out of here thinking, all right, now I've taken business law. Somebody comes up to me and says, would you write a letter saying you're going to collect debt? That makes you a debt collector. Attorneys write letters to people saying, you owe my client money. If you don't pay, we'll sue you. And don't put this validation notice on it. Well, that makes them a debt collector, and they're not complying with the law, and they end up getting in trouble for it. I say some attorney. I mean, most attorneys are smart enough to know that they need to comply with the law when they send notice to somebody, but it does happen. So don't try to collect the debt without complying with this act. So it's, it says prohibits collection agencies, but that's very broad. Anybody who attempts to is in the act of collecting debts should Where do would this. Where find out more information about like, what time they can call you? Um, I would probably go to... Um, and I hate to say Google it, but uh, you could pr probably go out to um, government sites that regulate in this area. And um, there's often like guides specifically as to what they can do, like you know everything from you know if they contact you at work, can right? Right. Yeah. So then the question is, is is that reasonable or not? Um, yes. What's that? Yes. I, mean, I guess it depends on you know what what somebody would say is reasonable. Not you, but you know, the course. Eight a.m. to nine p.m. Eight a.m. to nine p.m. Oh, the time zone. Well, I said re I said reasonable. You said yes. She said three a.m. Also, that's all the time zone that you're calling. Because you could be in California. Right. Well, that was what I was about to say. I mean, it, it would depend not upon where they're calling you from, but where yeah, no, you're at. Where you were located. Yeah. So, yeah, I would definitely go out. Um, if you don't have any luck, email me. I can point you to the site that has the information. Um, and, and you do have to be careful of that because a lot of times you'll get you know, the, the creditor, the collector's perspective on that. So you want to make sure that it's your rights, not what they say. Uh, I was, um, 
I put a video in my online class where um, it's a recording of a conversation of a debt collector trying to collect a debt, and um, basically they called somebody at work, and then so then they call the person at home after that, and then the person who's at home says, um, "I do not want you calling me at work." because they were looking at the statute and the requirements in terms of it notifying that you don't want to be contacted at work. And the person said, we will contact you at work. And they said, no, I, I do not want you contacting my employer. I don't want you contacting me at work to collect this debt. And the, the person on the other end said something about, you watch us. We'll call you tomorrow at your place of employment, and we'll call it a, um employment history check or something. You know, like trying to figure out ways around the law and what. So I think the, the act and the specific requirements are the best place to, to get that information. All right, so that's that. Now let's go look at the practical exercise. Well, let me start.